Well, welcome to the ISS, particularly uh, those of you who've not been before and uh, those of you who are giving up last-minute Christmas shopping opportunities. Uh, the ISS, as many of you know, has been studying the conflict in Afghanistan um, over the last few years. Indeed, um, the best part of a year ago, we published this, which was a comprehensive assessment of all the dimensions of the Afghan conflict um, with regard to the prospects for transition to 2015 and also Afghanistan's prospect, prospects afterwards. Uh, this autumn, we've had two events on Afghanistan, uh, giving the perspective of ISAF's media spokesman on the war as a whole and the media dimension of it, and also the assessment of the most recently returned uh, British tactical commander in Helmand province. Uh, and if any of you miss them but want to see them, they're easy to find on the events part of the ISS website. Now, this event takes a different perspective and covers a different topic. Indeed, it's the only event held by any think tank on this topic uh, that we know of. But just to set the context, NATO and the Afghan government are focused on achieving Afghan leadership of security across the country by the end of 2014, a little over two years ahead. This requires them to improve security, to grow the Afghan forces, develop the capability of the Afghan state, reduce corruption, and also persuade reconcilable insurgents to lay down their arms. And that's the center of gravity of this talk. But of course, the US surge ended at the end of September, and NATO troop numbers are reducing. Security transition is uh, continuing, but of course, this autumn, we saw, we saw the threat of so-called insider attacks <coughs> increased. Now, much of that was covered in the previous two uh, meetings. There's also, of course, a political dimension to Afghanistan. And much of the commentary in Western media has focused on efforts to arrange strategic level negotiations with the leadership of the Taliban. Considerable political effort still continues to be made on this despite great difficulties. Indeed, 10 days ago, uh, the South Asia Security Conference that the RASS and the US National Defense University ran, the opportunities and considerable challenges of this were a major topic of discussion, uh, including some very frank discussion by Afghan and Pakistani officials. But of course, at the opposite end of the telescope, the Peace and Reconciliation Program seeks to persuade members of the Taliban insurgency to reconcile with the Afghan government. And over 5,000 insurgents have joined the program. Now, we're very lucky to have Major General David Hook of the Royal Marines here to brief the ISS on this. And I'm confident he will find this an interesting story and one that, that has not previously been told. I'd add that this is the only public briefing being given on this subject we know of. The general will speak for about 30 minutes, after which he will take questions. His talk will be on the record, but the subsequent question and answer will be off the record. David. Thank you. I'm going to stand up so you can see the slides uh, more clearly. Um, two uh, warnings. First of all, I was horrified uh, at when I was talking to Ben that the idea that this is going to be on the internet and you'll be able to look at it, so I'll be able to look at it afterwards and see how well it really went. And the second is he's given me control of the slides. Now, for those of you that have dealt with Marines before, it has a button that says next and a button that says back, and there's a button in the middle. So as I'm talking, being a Marine, I'll probably be fiddling with it. So if the slides go all over the place, please forgive me. Um, let me start by putting uh, my perspective in Afghanistan in context. Um, I've actually done two tours in Afghanistan in the last four years. I did just under 13 months in 2008-9 as the Deputy Commander of Regional Command South before it split. Uh, and during that period, um, we saw in, uh, uh, sorry, I was the DCOM operations, we saw in what we called the Bush Surge, and I led the work for the McChrystal 60-day review for the South that subsequently became the surge that Ben has just talked about. Uh, I then came back here for just over 22 months and then went back for another 13 and a half month tour to run the force reintegration cell. Uh, let me start by uh, putting reintegration in the context of what the Afghans define as the three tracks in terms of reconciliation and reintegration. Track one is all about the political process. Again, Ben mentioned it in his opening remarks. And this is the idea of the grand bargain um, that you hear many people and many commentators write about. Perhaps the best example publicly talked about is the Qatar office, where members of the Taliban... Uh, members of the international community, uh, sadly when I left, uh, not officially the Afghan government, were getting together to talk about some sort of reconciliation deal. 
There is a lot of activity in reconciliation. This is the last time I'll talk about it because we ISAF played no part in any of the reconciliation work that was being undertaken. But because of the relationship uh, as part of my role I had with Masoom Staniksai and Saladin Rabani, the two key Afghans in terms of this process, we did touch on elements of how reconciliation played into the broader peace process. There has been a tremendous amount of activity in the last 12 months in this area. We have the involvement of the Saudi government and Afghan uh, High Peace Council members visiting Saudi to talk to them about how they might help this reconcili uh, reconciliation process. You've recently had the High Peace Council visit Pakistan, uh, and, and I saw on the web when I was just looking at some of the more, most recent news, a 15-point plan was agreed uh, to take forward Pakistan's involvement in the reconciliation process with Afghanistan. You also have Turkey's involvement as head of the OIC, and you also have the Heart of Asia process established in the last 18 months, which is all about bringing together the regional actors to build a better future in Afghanistan. So lots and lots of activity. I wouldn't stand here and suggest from what I know that we've seen significant strides forward. But the fact is that the, the people who need to talk are now either talking to each other or on the cusp of being involved in the discussions. The second component is high-level reintegration, track two. Track two is about the Afghan government tempting high-level insurgent leaders, primarily Taliban and HIG, to come across from fighting against the government to supporting the government. Perhaps the best example is, uh, of recent times is Mutasim Agajan. He was head of the Taliban Finance Committee. Um, he, uh, there was an attempt on his life in 2011. Uh, he was whisked out of the country. Uh, he now lives in a third country. And he is involved in trying to bring together interested parties. Um, and the High Peace Council, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment, 50% of the membership of the High Peace Council are ex-Taliban leaders, or HIG leaders, rather, so both. Uh, the third element is the Afghan Peace and Reintegration Program, uh, and I'll talk about that in much more detail. And very important, and if nothing else today, if you only remember one thing, the APRP is owned, designed, led, and executed by the Afghans, for the Afghans. ISAF and the international community support it. They do not lead it. Um, it led to some creative tension in my role because obviously General Allen wanted to see reintegration go much more quickly and he was therefore pressuring me to push the Afghans to do more, more quickly. Um, but it, for the force reintegration cell, it was a golden rule that we never got out in front of the Afghans. And therefore it went at a pace that they could uh, feel comfortable with, rather than a pace that we necessarily thought uh, could be delivered uh, if they had a, a better process within it. So let me start by dispelling a few myths about what the APRP is and is not. Uh, and during my time, I, this slide was gradually developed because um, uh, I was asked many of these questions many times. Um, so what is it? Well, first of all, as I've said, it's an Afghan-led process. Um, in academic work on reintegration, th there are four, level, four types of reintegration that are identified. Um, people giving up fighting and just going home. People going home because they're paid to stop fighting. A formal DDR process. And then a social reintegration process. There are four distinctive types, as I say, in academic circles. The APRP is a social reintegration process. And most academics suggest that the social reintegration process is the one that has the best chance of success. And I'll come on to the social aspects of the program in due course. Uh, another very important part of this is it's centered at very much at the local level. Uh, and one of the things that, that we found was quite interesting is we did an analysis of everybody who came into the program was interviewed and filled out a questionnaire. Uh, and we then analyzed why people were fighting. 80% of the questionnaires that we analyzed suggested that people were fighting because of a grievance, not because of ideology. And part of the design of APRP was to try and address the grievance uh, that occurred locally that caused people to fight. Now, why is that important? Because again, these um, studies that were done and these papers that were analyzed suggested that 
Over 75% of the fighters who were fighting at the lowest level were fighting within 20 miles of their village and were fighting because of a grievance. So if you can address it locally, you therefore can pull them in. Uh, it focuses on communities, and I'll talk about that later in the presentation, so I'll skip over that now. Uh, and as it says, it's a long-term process for all Afghans. And again, that'll become clear when I talk about phase three of the process. Um, uh, and again, Ben touched on this very briefly, but General Al in particular saw this as an integral part of the campaign. Um, and indeed, he often, when he and I discussed it, talked about this was the non-kinetic part of the, com of the campaign, even though he didn't own it. He was very keen that ISAF could provide the maximum support to get the maximum campaign leverage out of reintegration. Uh, it's a key building block of transition, and, and I can come back to that in due course, uh, and it, it self-evidently it's a part of, of the peace process uh, in its totality. What it isn't, uh, and this is perhaps the most important part of this, is it's not an economic package for fighters. Um, those of you that, and there will be some here who have studied the various attempts at reintegration and peace building in Afghanistan, the earlier programs that were run in the country failed. Peace Through Strength is a very good example. It was run in 2004, 2006. And part of the reason they failed was it was about paying an individual and keep paying him to stop fighting. This is not a program that financially rewards people for stopping fighting. There is money given to a fighter for three months, and I'll come on to that when I talk about demobilization. But it's about a social contract between the fighter and the community. It's not surrender. Very, very important, particularly when dealing with the Taliban. This is about a fighter being allowed to come home with his honor and dignity intact. Something that sometimes we in the West find quite difficult to understand because some of these individuals who have reintegrated have done some things which you think a community would never forgive them for. Um, actually, 99% that come back are forgiven by the community that they want to go back to for the acts that they would committed, and this is part of the social contract. Again, I'll cover that in more detail in due course. It's not a compromise on human rights, uh, and, and I'm sure I'll get asked a question on this. Um, you know, the fact is that when you enter this program, you are given amnesty for crimes um, within the gift of the Afghan government to give you amnesty for. It's written in the program document that if you have committed an act that is prescribed by international law, then you will be held to account for it. <laughs> One of the difficulties we've had, uh, and, um, and it is a challenge, is to work out whilst we're in a conflict and we're implementing the program, how we do that component as well, and I can come back to that in questions. And finally, uh, and, and for me, um, it's not easy or quick. A um, number of Americans who came in to serve in ISAF headquarters who had experience of Iraq thought we were going to get a similar effect out of the Afghan peace and reintegration program, the idea of, a, of an awakening. Well, frankly, the tribal dynamics in Afghanistan are just so hugely complex, and that plays a part in this, that it was never going to be easy. Uh, and it isn't. Um, and uh, whilst fascinating, can occasionally be frustrating. So let me talk a little bit about how, how it's been built, and I'll, I'll skip through this relatively quickly. We talk about the program having been built in three phases. Phase one, internal and international political consensus and support. Phase two was building it while executing it. And now phase three, uh, and I put October 12 because that was the end of my time, but we're in phase three now. It's accelerating the reintegration process. So phase one, as I say, was all about international uh, community commitment and internal political support. And the two key conferences in this long list were the London Conference at the start of 2010, where the international community came together and agreed, first of all, to support this program, but also to fund it, because this program is completely funded by the international community. For me, the second component that, was, that, that is, was critical to the design and execution of the program was the traditional jirga that took place in the summer of 2010. And this was a bringing together of about 2,000 Afghans, representative from across the country, who sat down and for a week talked about how this process should be enacted within Afghan cultural norms. Um, and some of the design of the program was lifted directly from that discussion that took place in amongst the Afghan population. It was then launched in October of 2010 uh, with a presidential decree uh, and a high peace council being established in a joint order. 
So we then moved on to the second phase, and, and this is where, uh, it, in many respects, uh, when you look at some of the academic papers going back to the beginning of 2011, this program has a mixed reputation. Frankly, uh, we wouldn't wish to have done it this way, and my predecessor uh, used the phrase, we were, we were building it as we were flying it. And we had people coming into the program who wanted to reintegrate when we hadn't sorted out all of the processes. And that caused some frictions and problems in the first nine to 12 months of the program. But from my perspective, I think it was a remarkable achievement by the Afghans. Their aspiration at the end of 12 months was to have the program in eight provinces and 1,000 reintegrees. By the end of 2011, it was in 27 provinces, and there were 3,500 reintegrees. So if you put it in the context of rolling it out in a challenging environment like Afghanistan against an aspiration when it was launched in October 2010 that many people thought was overly ambitious, the Afghans, and admittedly, you know, ISAF provided a lot of support at the start, did a fantastic job of rolling this program out. But it rolled out with problems that we've been addressing throughout that 12-month, 14-month period. And then we're into accelerating it. And, and again, uh, I, I won't go through this in a huge amount of detail because I'll talk about it in, in, um, in a little bit more detail towards the end. But there were a set of things happened at the start of 2012 which created a, a, a very good environment for reintegration to pick up, and indeed it did. And we saw 60% more people come in this year than we saw last year, and many more people entering the process than ever before. And primarily, that was because of Bonn, Chicago, and Tokyo. The international community made a long-term commitment uh, to Afghanistan, and that long-term commitment changed to a degree the psychology within the country, because they were no longer concerned that it was going to be another pick at, uh, at the end of a conflict that the international community was going to run away. We had made a long-term commitment, and as a result of that, many people then felt that now was the time um, to support a more positive outcome rather than equivocate because they weren't certain of the outcome. But the other thing that was really important was the announcement of the Qatar office when it came into the papers. It was fascinating watching that ripple through the insurgency, looking at the intelligence that I was given access to. The low-level fighters were asking themselves the question, so the leaders are telling us to go and fight in the summer. They're not willing to come in the country. They're living the life of Riley in Quetta and now they're running off to Qatar to cut themselves a deal. What does that mean for us? Uh, and actually, the reason that the Taliban pulled out of the Qatar office was not because of any broken promise. It was to reassert their authority over the organization because of the perturbation it caused when this occurred. Um, I'll run through this quickly. Um, uh, it, it, primarily, this is the important bit, which is the Afghan structure that supports the process. At the top, you have the president, uh, you may remember in his two th November 2009 speech at the start of his second term, he made peace and reconciliation a central component of his second term in office. He established the High Peace Council appointed by him to run the process um, and the Joint Secretariat to execute it. And down at the provincial level, it's the Provincial Peace Committee, uh, the Provincial Joint Secretariat team and the Provincial Governor that provide the guts of the process. ISAF obviously supports both at the strategic level. My role at the, at the FRIC was to support COMISAF, the NATO SCR, but also the Afghan government institutions. And at the bottom level, the regional commands do the same. And of course, because it's an internationally funded program, the donor embassies were very important in providing the continuing international commitment to the program itself. So let me talk a little bit about the three stages. Uh, and again, we can, we can go into more detail of this in question. Stage one, uh, outreach, negotiation, and confidence building. Frankly, this is about having a negotiation about what it would take to bring you in uh, from the fight to support the government. Uh, very tricky because of the low confidence that exists in a country that's seen war for 33 years. And one of the things that happened very early in this program, somebody was negotiating to come in. He was then picked up. And of course, that caused a trust issue with the program as well. One of the, the issues we had as we were building the program. Generally, we see eight to 10 people coming in, a low-level leader and his group come in with him. And those negotiations can take up to three months. The second element is demobilization. Again, for, the, for those that study this, this is the DDR component of the process. An individual, once he 
He decides to commit, he enters the demobilization process, hands over his weapon, normally at a small ceremony or a big ceremony, depending on how many there are. He goes through a vetting process, both at the provincial and the national level. And I'm always asked, how confident are you in the vetting process? Well, the fact is the Afghans decide who enters, and the Afghans turn away between 150 and 300 a month from the process that they say are not bona fide fighters. They then enter a three-month demobilization package in which it is the only time that they receive any financial remuneration. And they receive $120 a month for three months. So whilst they're going through this retraining, they can sustain their families. And at the end of the three-month point, um, they become normal citizens of Afghanistan. The money stops, and they are no longer paid by the program. And we then move into phase three, which is the consolidation of peace and community recovery. And this is why I said at the start, this is social reintegration. This is about the community being rewarded for taking fighters back into their community. 65% of the money is focused on community recovery. And it's about letting the community pick something it wants to do, giving it a grant of money for sh a short-term development opportunity, and then a large proportion of the money is given to Afghan ministries who come in with medium-term development. The deal is for this that up to 50% of the people employed should be reintegrated. So 50% from the local community that's decided what it wants and fighters come in uh, and are employed through this program. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the, of the amount of money. Um, this year, $160 million provided by the international community to support the program. Uh, and what do the local population think about it? What do the Afghans think of this? I, 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 this, for me, was, was quite an interesting piece of analysis that was done of which this was the outcome. When this process started, there was an even split um, as we were talking about uh, a peace and reconciliation process as to who would take fighters back and who wouldn't. And you can see over time uh, that as people have become more aware, there's a greater willingness to take people back. Frankly, there's also, we're completely tired of war and we want peace. And if this is a way of doing it, then we'll support this as well. Uh, but it also reflected the amount of effort that was put into communicating what the Afghan peace and reintegration program was all about. Because the 50% in July who didn't support it, a large proportion of those had never heard of it, which is another reason that this analysis was important for us, because it allowed us to help the Afghans with an information campaign to explain what the peace process was all about. Where does it fit into the campaign itself? Well, as I said at the start, General Allen sees this as an extremely important component of the campaign. The top half of this slide was uh, part of the letter he wrote, which was one and a half pages long at the start of his command. Uh, and it was the first substantive paragraph in which he talked about the insurgent has, has a choice. He can fight, uh, he can be captured, or he can reintegrate. Uh, and as I said before, he sees it as the non-kinetic component of the campaign. Uh, he then identified in the summer of this year a set of circumstances to build on the acceleration, which is the bottom half of this slide, about the circumstances at the time with Ramadan falling early, that there was an opportunity with everything that had gone on over the winter, the politics that I described earlier of international commitment and Ramadan being a time of peace and self-reflection, to bring all of that together to sell a very powerful peace narrative to the nation. Uh, why do they fight, why do they reintegrate, uh, and what do they want to do? Uh, as I said, um, very little, 20%, fight for what appears to be ideological reasons. Uh, and these are not, you know, these are, these, these are taken directly from talking to those that have come into the process. Why did they stop? For me, this was more interesting when we looked at this. Uh, whilst they said um, they didn't want to be targeted, look at how many are tired of fighting. Now, to a degree, uh, of course, I would interpret it this way. Uh, this was as a result of the extra military pressure with the surge, but also the significantly increasing size, capability, and competency of the Afghan National Security Forces. Uh, and what do they want to do? Uh, well, I won't go through those. You can, you can read those for yourself. Uh, and my final slide before I take questions. By region, uh, where have we achieved significant numbers and where haven't we? Uh, frankly, the greatest success has been in the north and the west, but then that shouldn't be surprising. 
um, because the security situation is much better there. Uh, and one of the, uh, or part of the calculus that the group makes before they come in is, how secure am I going to be personally if I enter the peace process? Um, but also, um, it, it's contributed in those areas to an even more peaceful situation than there was before this started. 